Good morning. I'm A.J. Wilson. Welcome to the Michigan State University Kellogg Biological Station. Today, Governor Snyder will share with us his special message on energy and the environment. And we also have three other sites joining us via Google Hangout at Next Energy in Detroit, the Michigan Land Use Institute in Traverse City, and finally, the Michigan Alternative and Renewable Energy Center at Grand Valley State University. Now live from Michigan State University, Vice President for Finance and Operations, Dr. Fred Poston. Well, thank you for, and welcome to Kellogg Biological Station, part of Michigan State University. It may seem strange to have a vice president for finance and operations, but actually I'm a scientist and I was dean of agriculture and natural resources before this, which I assume is how I was invited down here today to welcome all of you. Today we have a treat. We have the governor of the state of Michigan uh, to speak, and he, I believe he intends to speak on uh, environmental issues and energy issues and governor with no more preamble you're on Thank you, Fred. well thank you it's great to be with you today and I want to thank the people from Michigan State um, for hosting this today and, and if any of you saw the picture last night I'm really happy to be at Michigan State today because I don't expect to get kicked in the head <laughs> had a close call last night at Michigan, so they missed me by that much. So this is a much safer environment. So I want to thank Michigan State for creating that nurturing, comfortable environment to do this in. Um, but I really do want to say thank you. Um, Fred, good luck, on, and I know you're going to do great in terms of being Dean of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. I want to thank Kay for hosting us here, and I had a chance to meet the faculty. And it's tremendous, the work that's being done here. And I really mean that. Um, when we were first looking at a site, this was the first site that popped to mind to me, and it was based on the long legacy and history of success here. I'm a Battle Creek boy. Uh, my summer place is out on Gun Lake. So I came by here all the time. And in terms of looking, I shared one story that goes way back, back to my junior high days, and it was called junior high back then, <laughs> is we actually had to do a leaf collection for science, and I remember that my big score was coming to Kellogg Forest and getting my leaf collection done and one-stop shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a wonderful place. So I'm happy to be back here and have an opportunity to highlight the great work being done. Now the topic today, energy and the environment. Um, one of the first questions I got earlier is, why do you have both topics together? They go together. There's not two separate worlds. There's not a world of just environment, nor a world of energy or economics. It's a symbiotic relationship, and they tie together. And that's why I thought it was critically important to give the message as one message in terms of talking about these issues. Now, I'm going to talk about them separately, but as I go through it, you'll see I'll stop and talk about some subset that kind of crosses over. It could have been in either part of the message because of the nature of what's involved. And I hope we keep that as an open mind to say there are not separate silos. There's a symbiotic world that we need to win together and be responsible together on. Um, with that, I'm going to kick it off on the energy front. The first thing on the energy front, I would say, is we're using the word adaptability. Whatever we come up with needs to be adaptable to changing circumstances. And one reason I say that is the velocity of change in our world is only going to increase in terms of things changing quickly. But also, we have a lot of variables that we need to address today. And I'll just use one illustration, and I'm not meaning this as a criticism, but if you look at the federal government, and this is true not just of the recent administration, but for many years, we've lacked a comprehensive national energy policy. And that's a big problem. If you're a state, how do you design a program that you can rely on for the long term if you don't know what the federal rules are? So one of the things about being adaptable is, is I want to have a program that can be in place that can adapt to what those changes are. And I truly encourage our president and the administration to work hard with Congress on putting in place a comprehensive energy policy for our country. The next thing on energy is there are really three pillars that when I look at energy issues, we go down a checklist of three issues that need to be addressed to do things in a responsible fashion. And the three pillars of energy are, first of all, reliability. We need reliable power. And we see, we've seen the importance of that. If you go back to 2003, we remember being in the dark when the system failed. If you look at the consequences of Sandy and what natural disasters can do. 
The second issue is affordability. We need affordable power. And we are somewhat challenged in this state. We've gone through some tough times, and we have a difficult environment. We are a higher cost place than a number of our surrounding states. And I think it's helpful to understand the reasons why. And then look at the long term to say, how do we get us on a path to be more affordable and to be proactive and constructive in that path? And the third thing is, is about protecting our environment. We need to think about that in terms of how we look at our energy choices, about what is best for our environment, and be responsible there. And that's one of the themes you'll hear me talk about later. For example, I'm going to talk about natural gas, because if you have an option between coal and natural gas, and they're even, I much prefer natural gas because of the environmental consequences. So those are the three pillars. In terms of specifics, let me dive into it. The first one I'm going to dive into in terms of specific points is an area that's a winner on all three. If you look at the pillars of reliability, affordability, and protecting the environment, the first one is something that I mentioned during the last election cycle is the starting point for a discussion on energy, and that's energy efficiency. The smartest thing we can do to begin with is how do we do better at not needing the energy to begin with because we're doing better practices. Now, I'm not going to go through all the things in the message. I am going to hit highlights because, believe it or not, those of you that know me, I load up things pretty heavily, and there's like 50 points in this entire message. And I don't want to see you all sleeping before I finish. <laughs> so I'm going to hit some highlights. But again, if you didn't hear something, that doesn't mean it's not in the message in terms of the overall plan. But on energy efficiency, the one I'm going to highlight right now is something that's working well, but we can do more of. And that's a program called Michigan Saves. Michigan Saves is a program that was a public-private partnership. It started with some public dollars going into it, but now it's actually leveraging private financial institutions, making loans to families and people to be more energy efficient. It's a great opportunity. We've had over 1,700 Michigan families take advantage of it. On average, they're saving about $350 a year. Isn't that a win for all of us? The interesting part is, when you hear about loans being made, the default rate on those loans is much lower than any normal default rate for similar loans. So everyone's winning in a program like that. And the real question is, is how do we scale a program up? Because we've got a lot more than 1,700 family units in Michigan. Let's get that going much more. In addition to that, though, let's not just talk about families. Let's talk about how this could apply to small business and how they can be involved in that process. So I really encourage you to look at programs like that. So there's a whole list of different steps we can do on energy efficiency. Michigan Saves is just one. In the message, you'll see there's a list of things, a number of things the state we're signing up to do ourselves in terms of us being more energy efficient. So that's something to work on in terms of going through that list. Um, one of the next things I want to mention is this reliability question. Um, Michigan has issues in terms of reliability, and we need to improve. Um, yesterday, it was very exciting. I was in Marquette, and I flew up to Marquette just to do this announcement because I think it is so important for the Upper Peninsula to be part of this. And it was really about a joint venture opportunity between We Energies and Wolverine Power Cooperative. And it's great to have you with us today, Eric, from Wolverine. That Wolverine made an investment in We Energies power plant up there to do the future environmental changes they need to make. And in exchange, they all win because they're going to be a sustainable source of power that's more energy efficient and environmentally thoughtful up in the Upper Peninsula. And it's our major source of generation in the Upper Peninsula. Because one of the areas that we have the greatest challenge for reliability is in the UP. We have about 16 yellow alerts a year, which basically means there's a power challenge in that geography. And that is not good for business, nor our citizens. We need to see that go away. And the cornerstone of that strategy is to have that power plant keep going and be successful. So I want to thank We Energy and Wolverine for working together to be innovative and do something really great. But the other part is, is we need better transmission in the Upper Peninsula. And we're having that discussion with a group called MISO, which is really the nonprofit that helps organize transmission throughout all the Midwest about how we can get better reliability. And longer term, you can see we're bringing up a chart here of the MISO service area. How do we even do better than just the UP in terms of saying, we need better connections and reliability within the state of Michigan? And what you're seeing up here on the wall, on the chart, is really a, it shows where the congestion charges are in the MISO service area. 
And red is not good, by the way, if you haven't figured that out already. It basically says this is where the power lines have the most congestion in terms of saying it's not traveling as quickly or as well as you'd like it to happen. Um, the UP shows yellow, but actually that's our biggest problem area in parts of northern lower peninsula. But you can see other parts of the Midwest are doing reasonably well. Um, we want to work with MISO to say, we're their biggest customer in many respects. How do we do better in terms of getting our fair share of better transmission within the state of Michigan? Both through the lower peninsula and the upper peninsula. And one message we want to send is, let's connect the peninsulas. We have some connections today, but we do not have major connections between the upper and lower peninsula. I don't know about you, but I view that as pretty common sense to say, shouldn't we have a strong connection between the two peninsulas? We just saw the value of that this last year in the broadband area. Literally, we did not have a strong connection there. If we're doing it in broadband, I think it's pretty clear we should be doing it in electrical connections. So a big part of this message is work we're going to be doing that may take several years, but there's no reason not to get started, not to get going, and not to make this happen. So I really appreciate you looking at that issue as something important. Now the next issue I'm going to switch to is an opportunity for Michigan. It's about both protecting our environment and looking towards the future. And that's we have an asset that I think we're underutilizing on the energy front. And that's our natural gas resources in this state. Michigan is actually a very strong natural gas state. We're not in the same league as a North Dakota, Louisiana, some of the states that are you know, either in the western states or the south. But relative to most of the other states, Michigan is a very strong place. And we have strong assets here, and we can do more with natural gas. And why am I bullish on natural gas is because compared to coal, it's a much better alternative. So how can we be strategic? So one thing I'm proposing is we actually look at the state creating a, a strategic reserve of natural gas. And not doing it just as the state, but how can we bring the private sector with us to do a public-private partnership to say we can be smarter and better about leveraging this asset? Because we have lots of natural gas on state land. Can we bring in private partners to say, how can we keep this as a resource and not have it just be a spot market phenomenon that people jump in and out of, but to have something that could be long-term sustainable to allow good investment from utilities or from industrial users to use our gas in a smart fashion? and to be able to store that energy. Michigan actually is one of the best states in the country for storing natural gas. So I think there's a good opportunity on the natural gas front that we should be emphasizing. And I think it's something that I'm glad to make people aware of. Now I'm going to give you a subset because it's actually more in the environmental piece, but it shows the crossover. When you talk about natural gas, one thing that can all of a sudden get people upset because there's a lot of issues and concerns about this issue, and it is an issue to have concern about, but there's a lot of misunderstanding is the issue of fracking. Um, you hear it in the common sense, and usually when I talk to people about fracking, all they've heard is the term, and then it's bad. And what I would say is, is fracking is something that is very serious, and it needs to be done the right way. And if it's done the wrong way, it is a very bad thing. Um, what I would put in perspective for you is there have been fracking problems, and fracking is how wells are being done in terms of chemicals and water being injected into a well to actually get increased production out of. So those of you that aren't fracking experts, and I'm not one, that's the simplest explanation. What we've been doing in Michigan is we have been doing fracking for well over a decade. We have fracked thousands of wells in Michigan. And one reason you never heard of fracking until recently is Michigan has done fracking very well. We've never had a serious problem in the state of Michigan. There have been serious problems in other states because of the regulatory scheme, how they work with industry or don't work with industry. We do fracking right in Michigan. That's not to say we should be content about where we're at. So what we're going to do, and I'm asking for this in the message, is we're going to be a partner with the University of Michigan's Graham Sustainability Institute on doing a study about where fracking's going and to work with both industry and environmental groups to say, shouldn't we all be working together to understand how wells are being done, are going to continue to involve, other things are going to be happening, and let's be at the forefront of being environmentally responsible when we look at these energy issues. Let's do this in a way where we're working together. So I think that's an important thing to say that we're doing well in Michigan, but we're not going to stop, and we're going to continue to do it well in a smart way, or we're not going to do it. 
So that's really the message about being smart about how we do things and being a leader. So I think there's good opportunity there. Now, one of the last groups I'm going to mention on the energy front, and it's last but not least because it is critically important, is the affordability question. One of the things we can do a better job on, in particular because of our cost, is how we work with vulnerable families. Um, so I'm going to be talking, and I have talked before with the legislature, about how do we deal with people in low-income situations to make sure they have the energy needs they need through the winters and difficult times. And I appreciate it. We've had good partnerships with our utility companies and having a dialogue. There are a couple bills in the Senate today that I think would be helpful because I'll give you one illustration. Currently, we've had a system where the funding mechanisms have not been clear. It's bounced around and it shouldn't bounce around. We want a steady system of how we're going to handle those issues in terms of funding resources. The other one is we have a system currently where too often we make people wait until they get shut off. Literally, the utilities go and shut them off and then they show up to say they need help, and then we turn them back on. And think about the huge waste and resources of people going out to spend time to shut someone off just so they can have to wait for someone to go turn them back on, rather than saying, can't we be smart enough to figure out these people need help and help them without going through that big mess? So that's something that I view as just simple common sense, but we've been going through that crazy business for years. Let's knock it off. <laughs> Let's go help these people. And the second piece is, is we actually have, we want to work with the federal government because they have some programs to help subsidize um, housing for people where they don't actually have any requirements for them to be energy efficient. So a landlord can be subsidized and actually do nothing to help energy efficiency, do nothing to do anything good. And we have to keep administering the program to help continue the subsidy rather than working with the family to say, hey, let's tell that landlord to get their act together or let's work with you to find better housing. So on the affordability front, I think there are really good things we can do there. So those are a number of things on the energy front that are important. So if it's okay now, I'm going to switch gears on you. But again, remember it's the same world. We're not leaving the world. We're just going to talk about environmentalism now. And that's critically important because, I mean, one of the things as a Michigander that I hope we're all proud of is we love our state. And when you talk about what's most precious to us, a lot of us are going to name something in our environment, whether it be the Great Lakes, whether it's going to be a lake. Quite often it's something to do with the water. But it's something we all love and that's very dear to us. And it's not about just economics. It's something that we're passionate about. So I think it's critically important we talk about our environment. Now on the environmental side, I'm going to really focus in on land and then water. First of all, on the land side, it's about time we get strategic. It's amazing that if you look at it, and I'm using state lands as an illustration, we own over 4 million acres. When I say we, we all do. You as citizens are part of the state of Michigan and we own about 10% of the land of the state of Michigan. Now, how did we get that land? It goes through a long history, but as a practical matter, we don't know the reason why we own a good chunk of the land we own. We know the most famous places, the pristine places, but a lot of it was collected going back 100 years. Um, and we really don't have a very strategic outlet on why we have it, what we're doing with it, and where it's going to go in the future, and how do we make sure we're the best stewards of it. We do a pretty good job, but it's time to step back and say, let's come up with a strategic plan for public lands in the state of Michigan. We got a good start, and I want to compliment the people. We had a blue ribbon panel on state parks and outdoor recreation, and they did some really good work. And I appreciate their work, and we're going to leverage off of that, but we need to go farther than that. So with the blue ribbon panel, a couple things I will mention is one area they talked about were trails. Um, one of the great opportunities we have in Michigan, and we'll bring up the, the trail map, is when we started doing the analysis, we figured out we don't know how many trails we have. I actually asked that question. What we do know is we probably have as many or more trails than almost any other place in the country. But could I tell you the number of miles of trails or what they're actually about? No, not really. We did highlight a few. And you probably can't see it real well, but one of the marketing messages that would be really cool is we did one in red to show we're within 200 miles of having a trail 
that would go from Belle Isle and Detroit to the Wisconsin border. That would be pretty cool. Now, I'm not going to answer the question about what do you do when you get to the Mackinac Bridge. You're on your own for those five miles. <laughs> but there's a great opportunity there for outdoor recreation. But you can see the trails in blue. And some of those trails go for several hundred miles that already exist. But let's look at our trails and how we can use this as a great asset and really leverage it in a positive way. But then to continue on to say for state forest lands, other state lands, um, we'll ask the federal government to participate. Um, how can we use and partner together in coming up with a real strategy? And I'm giving that charge to essentially the Department of Natural Resources. And I know we have, Keith is up in Traverse City today, Keith Cray. So he can work on that project. But the goal is to have a report coming back by next springtime, at least on a framework of what we should be looking at for state public lands. So I think it's a great opportunity. Um, then you just keep going in terms of some of the environmental issues um, in terms of land use. One area that's really important too, and I'm going to switch from vast forest lands to our urban areas. We need to do a better job with our urban areas. Um, we have a challenge on blight in terms of where there are structures that should be torn down. In many cases, a lot of these will revert to a city, a county, the state through tax reversions. And we don't do a good job of managing that whole process. We don't do a good job of figuring out what to do with those parcels to aggregate them in some thoughtful, responsible fashion. And we're going to be focusing on that. I've been talking about that already. I have mentioned that in the public safety message I gave. But I'm not going to give up on this issue. There's a much better way to be responsible with public lands that are in urban areas in terms of aggregating, working together as a team to say, what's a good long-term use? Also, as part of that, we need to be a better neighbor in terms of the public sector. Quite often, we'll end up with these lands, and we may not be doing the mowing, the maintenance, the way we should be doing. And to the degree we have these properties, we need to be more responsible in terms of going through that system. I also want to be more aggressive with respect to people that misuse lands. Because quite often today, we'll have people buy properties at auction that their only goal is, is to say, can they do something short term with it to make some quick money. Otherwise, they just let it revert again because it's cheaper for them to come back and buy it at auction again than to even pay the property taxes. And that's not right. So one thing I mentioned before that I'm going to continue to mention is if someone has a bad track record of not paying their property taxes, of not maintaining properties, I don't believe they should be eligible to participate in the auctions. Let's just get that off the table in terms of working through that. Other pieces of urban issues is it's time for us to finally get the right to farm issues sorted out for urban areas. Our agricultural community, our ag lands are critically important. Right to farm is critically important. I'm a big supporter of that. But with respect to our urban areas, we've had this dialogue going on for multiple years now about urban farming. And all I've seen in my two years as governor is there's been a lot of discussion about right to farm and urban farming. If you know me well enough, I don't like to pe see people talk too long. We've passed that point. There is too much talk and not enough action. So we really need to get focused in on getting something done on that issue in terms of moving ahead. So in terms of land management, there's a big opportunity there. So just in terms of some exciting things I would mention on this front is we've got the whole issue of public lands. We've got the whole issue of trails and recreational opportunities that we can leverage better. The Blue Ribbon Report is good stuff. Urban areas, excellent opportunities in terms of doing better work there. Now let me shift to water. Again, something near and dear to our hearts. And I should have mentioned it earlier, but I'll, let me do the same thing that I did with the energy side. What's the framework for decision making? Is it's an ecosystem approach, which is basically something that is about taking science and economics and environmental practice and merging them together and doing them in a thoughtful way. So when we talk about water or land, let's do an ecosystem approach, not simply the old-fashioned way of saying there's one place or another place. There's a system. And we need to understand how the system works in totality, and we want the system to work effectively together. So I apologize. I should have done that at the very start. But it's a big approach that I'm a big believer in. And actually, I want to give credit. I learned it from some work I used to do with the Nature Conservancy. Um, it's a term that works well around the world, and I would hope in Michigan we can be a leader in applying these tools.
So on the waterfront, the first area is the Great Lakes. Um, you may have wondered why I haven't talked about this before. It was really because we've had a lot of legacy crises in Michigan across the board, our tax system, our budget system. And so I felt we had to get those under control first. But I've always been passionate about this topic. The Great Lakes, we need to do better on. And now's the time for us to start speaking up. And to start that process, one of the first things that got announced on Monday is I'm going to assume the co-chair role of the Council of Great Lakes Governors. Because Michigan needs to be more of a leader. And we need to do a better job on pushing issues with the Great Lakes and water use overall. So one of the first things I'm going to ask for is to do a summit of the Great Lakes governors and the premiers for the two provinces and bring people together. And I've already started the early dialogue to say, can we hold that up at Mackinac Island um, sometime in the next year to really get us all together? Because that hasn't happened for several years to really create that dialogue. And one of the key topics will be aquatic invasive species. Um, if you look at it, we need to do better. The Asian carp issue, we're not cutting it. A number of other issues, we're not cutting it. And again, it's taking a system approach to say, how do you deal with prevention and education, first of all? And there's a lot more education we need to do with our people, all of us, about the issues. The next one is, is early detection and response. And then, to the degree we haven't been successful there, is what do you do for control and management? and set up a very systematic way to say for each one of these aquatics, invasives, how do we address it? And to give you some idea, the identified number that I've been seeing is about 180 already. That's a lot, folks, a lot more than just an Asian carp. And you can see, we don't want these things in the Great Lakes. <laughs> so let's get going on that. And that will involve us getting involved on issues of ballast water, we already have the toughest rules around, but we need to talk to the other jurisdictions about what can be done to bring up their standards in the federal government. It needs to be talking about canals and rivers coming into the Great Lakes. What do we do for prevention? We all know about the electric fences and the challenges of those. Um, and how do we deal with the whole issue about importation of various goods, products, where, you know, through different mechanisms? And how do we stop those from creating issues here? So the other thing in addition, to joining the Council of Great Lakes Governors is I'm very pleased to say we had John Allen join us in the Office of Great Lakes. And I want to thank Consumers Energy for contributing, John, because we wanted to put more resources involved in this. So we're going to be working flat out and hard on the Great Lakes as an issue, particularly with aquatic invasives, but the whole issue of water use, water control, long-term opportunities, including good things like even tourism. I mean, if you haven't been there yet, go up to Alpena to the Thunder Bay Sanctuary and stuff. There's really cool stuff. Um, I'm hoping to go do a dive there next summer if I can find time to pull it off. Now, beyond the Great Lakes, there are water issues we need to continue working on. And that gets to our inland lakes and rivers and waters and the whole issue of water usage. And we need to do better there. And I think this is something that many of us have talked about for a long time. We always like to talk about water being a strategic asset to the state of Michigan. Well, we've always talked about, but we've never had a strategy to make it a strategic asset. Now's the time to do that. If you think about it, think about what happened this last year with the drought conditions across the Midwest and our country. Who is the state that theoretically, if we would have had a strategy, could have been the best prepared because of having water available? It's the state of Michigan. Instead of being reactive, I want us to be proactive. And to do it in a responsible fashion to say it's not about wasting water, just using water, but how do you use water as an asset that's sustainable to help with agriculture, industry, and quality of life? So one of the things we're going to talk about is having the DEQ reestablish a water use advisory council um, to really get a better dialogue going of participants about how we can use the water withdrawal tool, and having it grow more, evolve in a proper, thoughtful fashion, make it more effective and better. How do we make that happen? How do we look at green infrastructure opportunities around our lakes, our rivers, and streams to say, instead of just concreting them over or damming them up, how do we make them more effective in a natural fashion that does better recharging of water resources so we can continue to use them? One of the exciting projects, I'm fired up to see the rapids back in Grand Rapids. 
So if you think about it on the water side, there's a number of really great things we can do there to make that much more effective. Um, so there are many more things in the message on land and water. But I'm going to keep going. Um, in terms of, there are some areas I would describe as integration opportunities, where things come together, and we can work together on areas. Um, a couple things I would mention. One is, that's already a success story, is MEEP, which we're doing with the agricultural community. And for those of you that don't know about it, it's the Michigan Agricultural Environmental Assurance Program. Don't try to say that fast three times now. But it's a great program we did with the farm community, the environmental community, all to come together to say, how can farms get certified? And it's a voluntary program to get certified to say they're doing best practice. And they're doing things effectively. And we want to acknowledge and be proud of anyone that's gotten certified and highlight their certified place, to be me certified. We have a similar program to help with environmental quality issues called RETAP that the Department of Environmental Quality runs that uses retired engineers. It's really retired engineers giving technical assistance program. So we want to up leverage that program. So if you're looking at how to be more green, how to be more energy efficient, we have resources and tools to help look at those kind of items. And we should be optimizing those more. Um, a couple other items is on the recycling front. I think it's time that we make a review of how we can improve recycling in Michigan. We don't do the uh, job as well as we should. One of the things that stood out to me in terms of um, ease of recycling, we did an analysis of how many counties have programs to make it easy in some fashion within their county, and we only found 21 of the 83 counties having the kind of recycling programs, even in some subset of their county, that we'd like to see. So there's a great opportunity there. So if you go down this list, there's a lot of good things that we can do that sort of integrate these issues. Um, in a thoughtful, effective way. Um, also, I'll go back to one subject matter on the big picture of energy and the environment, because it was a, one of the ballot question issues, was Proposal 3. And I wanted to mention to people, I talk about it in the message, that we do need to set new goals as we approach 2015. But let's set them together. And let's set them as Michiganders working together as a team. Because my belief is we need to increase the goals but let's spend the next year, let's spend 2013 having an open dialogue with all the participants, understanding where we're at, how well we've done, and we've done well on some of these things. We're actually doing better on energy efficiency than even the goal we had set from most reports I'm getting. So it's a good time for us to re-up to say, let's celebrate some of our successes, let's set some new goals for beyond 2015, but let's do it together and let's do it in a thoughtful way and do it through the legislative process the way we should. So I'm very much a supporter of that. I believe industry is a supporter of that. I believe we're all on the same page. But let's kick off that process. And let's take 2013 as a year where we can have an open dialogue. So actually, in the message, you'll see there's a timetable um, to actually say, we're going to start holding meetings. We're going to start that process to make that happen. Because that's all good stuff. So I'm going to sort of wrap up here, because I want to get to your questions. But hopefully you can see, if you step back from all of this, and look at the energy and the environment. Now is the time to be more proactive. We don't have all our tax issues done, all our budget issues done, all our other challenges figured out, but we've made tremendous progress. Michigan was and is the comeback state, and we're getting our act together. And now it's time for us to step up on some things that are critically important, and these are two topics that tie together that we can really be proactive on and instead of sort of saying we own a bunch of land, instead of saying we have a whole bunch of natural gas in our state, let's talk about how we can have a long-term strategy that makes a difference for us and for our kids. And understand that if we make decisions today, we're affecting what's going to happen to them in 20 years. And be responsible. And do this in a strategic fashion so we can win together, short-term and long-term and understand in energy, affordability, reliability, and protecting the environment. In the environmental side, an ecosystem approach that says it's about sound science and good economics partnering together to do smart decision making. Let's make all this happen. There's no better time to do it. There's an urgency and need to make it happen. I'm fired up to get it done. And part of this message is, I hope you are too. So let's all speak up and say, it's time to move this. 
much higher on the agenda list. Let's move forward and let's get it done. So thank you for coming today and thank you for all these sites and let's do some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Governor, our first question comes from Jennifer, and she's uh, here in our live uh, audience uh, from Hickory Corners. Jennifer, could you raise your hand so we can – where are you sitting? Hi, Jennifer. Uh, she asks, do you have plans to expand programs that help support water quality and natural resource conservation on private working lands? Yeah, I would say so. If you look at – I think MEEP is a good illustration of that, about how we do a better job there. Um, because that involves farmers doing best practice for any kind of resources they have on their land, but we could expand that beyond farms. I don't see why we couldn't do that potentially with industrial sites, commercial sites. Again, broaden it out in terms of, I love programs where it's a voluntary program where people sign up to say they're doing really good stuff and we can celebrate success. So I would actually encourage that in terms of working through something like that. Also, one area I didn't go through that, I, that might tie into some of the things that could be a concern, given your question, is there's a fair amount on wetlands in there that we're actually going to work hard on improving how we handle wetlands in Michigan, including coming up with better systems to actually do banks and exchanges of potential wetlands properties to do that in a much more strategic fashion instead of simply saying one acre here ends up someplace on that same parcel rather than saying there's a better answer to help the whole community or the broader state by doing wetlands in a smarter way. Thank you, Governor. We're going to go now to Detroit and the next energy location via Google Hangout. Go ahead, Detroit. Hi, Governor. Thanks for this. This is Jim Newman from Newman Consulting Group. And most of the people in the audience probably are aware that buildings use approximately 40 percent of the total energy and 70 percent of the electricity in the United States, which is really more than any other sector, including transportation. You've mentioned energy efficiency here and talked about what we're doing, what we in Michigan are doing on residential, and we have many agencies such as Michigan Saves, MEDC, DEGC, and many others. But since approximately 70 percent of the buildings standing today will still be here in 30 years, has any thought been given to ways for the state to make it easier to conserve energy in existing commercial buildings similar to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, Energy Policy Act of 2005, and some of the other federal programs that have come and gone? Yeah, in terms of your question, I appreciate it. It's great to have people from Next Energy there, and I'm glad to have all the remote sites. It's great to see the better marketing these days. If you look at it, they're good at showing off Next Energy, aren't they? <laughs> and they should. They should be proud of that. It's a great place. Is In terms of doing that, what I would say is that gets back to my point about the lack of federal energy policy. Because if you look at it, some of those were huge kind of public works kind of projects, and we're not in a position to do that. And what I would say is I would rather partner with the federal government on thoughtful policies and practices to say if they're going to do it, let's not get into winners and losers as much as coming up with a broader-based approach that really encourages people to make those improvements on a broad basis. Um, programs that we are going to stay focused in on are how can we do public-private partnerships. So it's just not the state, but we're bringing the private sector. That's why I like Michigan Save so much because it's private financial institutions making loans that are good loans, that are making good returns to them, that are good deals for everybody, and everybody wins. So what I would say, it's not going to be about government, state government spending lots of money on programs, but how we can be a coordinator, a facilitator to make good programs happen, because you're right. If the more we can do to retrofit buildings, to do more brownfield work, brownfields are in the message, we can do a better job. Governor, thanks. We're going to go now to Traverse City, the Michigan Land Use Institute. Traverse City, go ahead with your question for the governor. Hi. Thank you very much, and thank you, Governor Snyder, for your uh, excellent event today. We're certainly enjoying it here in Traverse City. My name is Jim Dalzo. I'm the Energy Policy Specialist for the Michigan Land Use Institute. And you were up here in, in March and saw what we're doing with the Traverse City SAVES program with the local utility, with some local nonprofits. Uh, with Michigan Saves and Better Buildings. And uh, you already said how cheap energy efficiency can be in terms of uh, uh, helping meet energy demand. It's so much cheaper than new generation. My question is twofold. Uh, given the uh, w well workings of energy efficiency, uh, what are you willing to do working with uh, advocates like us, lawmakers, utilities, and industry to stop attempts that are going on right now in our legislature to roll back our existing optimization standard, our existing RPS standard. Um, we're quite concerned about that. 
And um, given that efficiency really does literally pay for itself, create good jobs, and other states like Vermont and California are doing 2% energy optimization a year and succeeding with it, is there any reason for us not to set a truly bold goal, one that will make Michigan a global leader in home, business, government, and industri industrial uh, efficiency within a decade? Jim, I can see why you're the specialist in this field. <laughs> as soon as you said that and I saw you, I knew this would be a good, tough question. <laughs> but I also want to compliment your organization because, as you mentioned, I was going to wait to mention it when you popped up on the screen, is they do some fabulous work. And I had an opportunity to actually go to a family's home in the Traverse City area to see how effective the SAVES program works. And it was really exciting. Um, to listen to the, the husband and wife and actually their kids talk about the cool stuff that went on in their home and how it's a better household now um, because of the efforts. But to get, go to your point specifically, one is I don't support the attempts to get rid of those requirements, and I've been pretty clear about that. Um, so I wouldn't be overly concerned. We always need to be cognizant, but I wouldn't see that as an immediate issue showing up on the table in terms of trying to make those requirements disappear at least if I have some say in the matter, which typically I do when it gets to the legislative process. <laughs> um, the second piece is your comment about setting bolder goals. I appreciate that, and that's part of the 2013 process. Because the good part is, is, as you said, some states went to 2%. We stopped at 1%. Again, from what I'm aware of is we're actually exceeding the 1% number already. And the question is, how well are we exceeding it? What's available next? But also, what are the programs to make sure we can hit those numbers going ahead? Um, the balancing act that I always need is to come back to the affordability question in some ways, because we need to be a little bit careful, because Michigan is at the higher end of cost structures for Midwestern states. Um, so that's that balancing act. So I view it as, I love you asking the question, keep on asking the question, keep on providing data on what other states are doing, how they're getting there, but let's bring everyone together so everyone can throw in their pieces and let's come up with a good number. Because again, I would like to see that number increase over what we currently have as we get to 2015 and beyond. Governor, thanks. We have standing by Grand Valley State University in Muskegon. Grand Valley, go ahead with your question. Uh, good morning, Governor. Uh, this is Arnold Bozart, uh, Director of the Michigan Alternative and Renewable Energy Center in Muskegon, Michigan, downtown. Um, we have a question for you from the west side of the state. Uh, our question is, with the already announced and expected retirement of coal-fired generation plants by the major utilities by 2015, what type of energy generation capability would you like to see built in their place? And how does this issue relate to your plans for the energy dialogues that you have just announced for 2013? Well, they tie right together. And I, that's a great question because as retirements come on, that's the cost-effective time to have a dialogue about what those replacements can be. And that's one of the issues where the dialogue about what's the renewable portfolio percentage can be relevant. It's also, if you ask any, the utility people in the state, they can tell you I've already probably driven them somewhat nuts about natural gas versus coal. Um, because those are kind of the questions that I like to bring up to say as retirements go on, because then you get the environment to say it's not about having a continuing cost to make our costs go even higher. If it's actually really being retired, so it's coming out of the rate structure and not creating affordability issues, that's the best time for us to look at replacements that are better for affordability, reliability, and protecting the environment. And we should have all three of those issues on the table. And again, I think our utilities are doing a good job. They're being thoughtful about raising the questions, but again, the more we can have the public dialogue, the more we get away from potential misunderstandings where people have an assumption that people are doing one thing or another thing, let's talk. And let's just get the cards on the table, and as we reset these goals, let's say one of our goals is long-term, there should be more renewables. I think everyone should know that's pretty common sense. Long-term, hopefully there's less coal. But will there be coal then? You can have a discussion of what part of that portfolio that is, or how that compares to other choices and at what price. Um, but these are the kind of dialogues and questions about building out this portfolio in a thoughtful way. So again, that's what 2013 is. Line up your questions, get your thoughts, and Get to the table and let's hash through it. Governor, our next question comes from our audience here. Uh, Bill from Hesperia. Can you raise your hand, Bill? 
And Bill's question is, assuming the legislative passes the severance tax on non-ferrous metals, how do you envision using the money for rural development? Um, great topic. Um, that's in the message we talk about um, our extractive industries, that we have two big industry areas that could be, are very exciting. Timber is very exciting. And actually, I'm calling for a timber summit next year. Um, we've created a timber advisory council. We actually have state resources focusing on now as timber is an industry in our state. It employs over 20,000 people in our state. Um, mining is also an opportunity, but again, we need to be environmentally responsible on that. We're talking about replacing the old ad valorem property tax system, the traditional property tax system, which is actually dumb for an extractive industry. It is not the way to do things. It should be a severance tax approach. I think everyone agrees on it. It's more of the details. We're getting close to getting a package done. Part of that package is part of those resources from the severance tax would go to a rural development fund to get to the specifics of the questions. I just want to set up so people could get some background. That we're going through now negotiating what the split is between local government and to the degree the state government gets dollars from a severance tax on mining. It would go to a rural development fund that's really intended to say it's there as that mining wraps up. Are we doing economic development efforts to say what's the next industry or what are sustainable jobs that could be created that came out of the fact that we had a resource in Michigan that was a depleting resource that was going to go away, um, but we could keep jobs going far longer than the life of whatever that mining operation might be. And so the real focus of that, it, it's not specific to one area, but one of the goals I want it to have is to say how can it be part of that dialogue to say how do we keep jobs going in that geography or that place after it's done because, again, we don't want to see the mine closed, people all of a sudden out of work, and there's nothing there. That was the history in Michigan. That's one of the reasons the UP had so many difficult times. Mining was a huge success. When the mining was done, too often the people that owned the mine just walked out and left people unemployed with not much of anything. That happened in our timber industry in the state too, by the way. Um, and that still shows up in some places across our state if you talk to people in their heritage and history. So let's get smarter, and that was part of the idea. Severance tax, not just to replace local services, but have some pot of resources to use for long-term economic development. Governor, uh, Detroit standing by again with a question from Next Energy in Detroit. Go ahead. Governor Schneider, I'm Patrick Gee with Reloom Technologies. We're an outdoor LED lighting manufacturer in, in Oxford, Michigan. And hearing what you said today, I'm, I'm wondering how you're going to uh, incentivize the, the usage of Michigan-based manufacturing companies in your efforts to increase the uh, energy efficiency. Yeah, it's really, a lot of it is, again, clearinghouse coordination. It's not going to be through big tax credits. Because, again, if you know me, I don't believe in picking winners and losers with big tax credit deals because I think we're paying a big price for that today in terms of how we're having economic challenges. What I would say, though, is a lot of it is getting people to understand in the LED case is if you do the longer-term analysis, if you do more than a one-year analysis, you can actually show how it saves money. It's actually a big benefit. And you just need to have a good system to determine how many years is that payback and does it really make sense and at what scale over what time period. So this is something I want to get the public sector out of this trap of just saying it's cash in, cash out, one year budget cycles and to encourage longer term thinking about what's the best answer. And so that's the analysis we're going to be doing more and more at the state to the degree we're a participant in helping support that because I know you've done some great projects already. Um, and it's really a case of asking industry to come to the table, commercial parties, and helping families understand. Because in many cases, if you looked at Michigan Saves, it actually costs more money to begin with day one, but then they save money year after year, and they get a good payback. So I view this as getting people educated on good economics, not necessarily the government giving out big incentives to people. Governor, can we have some final thoughts? Yeah, I appreciate it. Hopefully it's been worthwhile, and I want to thank all our remote sites. It's great to have Next Energy. Um, the Michigan Advanced Research Center on Energy and um, the Land Use Institute to be part of this. It's great to have you participate in this process. I want to thank everyone for being at this special place, and I, hopefully this is a good commercial for you to come back and visit and learn more about this special place. But overall, let's again go back to the message of this is not just something we should work on either energy or the environment. This is just not about taking it for granted like too often we have to say we own a bunch of land or to say we have these lakes. Let's be proactive. 
let's really say, how do we grab these as an issue to say this is something special and show some leadership. We have unique assets in our state that many other people in the world wish they have. And don't take it for granted. Let's do something with it. And let's do something with it in a responsible ecosystem approach where it's about science, economics, short term and long term. To say this is about how we win for the long term. Because one thing I think we all take with great pride is what we inherited. And shouldn't we give it in as good a condition or better condition than what we received? And that's the way we need to look at this. And doing it in a smart way where we're also building an economy that creates jobs, economic growth, and resources to reinvest for the long term. And that's where that symbiotic relationship is so important. None of this is an island. We're just not two peninsulas. We're all in this together as Michiganders. So thank you for your time and effort to come here. I really look forward to your feedback because the point of these messages is to start a dialogue, but a dialogue that results in action. So this is talking today, but I want to see this translate into real action and real strategy. So thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks, Ellen. How are you? Hey, good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yes, sure. Thank you. Aaron, thanks for all your help. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Very good. And we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Fred uh, Poulsen, if you have some uh, closing remarks also, Oh, we please. got a lot on this list. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I think we're, uh, we're at uh, that appointed hour, and I wanted to thank the governor for selecting Kellogg Biological Station for, uh, for this, uh, this dialogue today. It's a premier environmental research site, and um, I, I heard about his leaf collection earlier. I wondered what the tie was. So. <laughs> I hope you got a good. I still have it. Okay. I'm a good nerd. I hope you got. I hope you got a good grade on it. That's the <laughs> main thing. But thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're really honored to be able to do this. And Governor, rest assured, Michigan State University will stand at your side and uh, interact as needed. I would also submit that I think we're going to be well served by your system's view of these issues. So thank you very much for coming.